the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening. I'm Theodore Shedlovsky, the chairman of this lecture series. My function here tonight is both very simple and very pleasant. It is very pleasant in part because it's very simple. I will say just three things. Firstly, a few words about the this particular lecture series, what it is, how it came to be organized. And uh, secondly, something about our speaker tonight. And thirdly, the announcement of his title. Now, you all have the, this little booklet of admission, which uh, serves the purpose of ticket of admission to the entire series. And uh, you will notice that this is the inauguration, the first lecture of the Jacob Wolf Lecture Series, which has been made possible through the generous support of the Lester and Kathleen Wolf Foundation. The lecture series, in all probability, will continue next year not necessarily on topics of science, but perhaps so. And we hope that it will continue for a long time to come. In organizing this particular series, we took care, of course, to invite not only men who were very well known and very competent in their particular fields of enterprise and science, but also people who are good speakers. You will notice in your booklets that the topics covered will include mathematics, physics, aspects of chemistry, biology, and of course, archeology span and the computer. This doesn't cover all of modern science by any means, but it seemed particularly appropriate to have as the first speaker a man who has done a tremendous amount in presenting to the general public, to the layman, if you will, aspects of science in a form that can be understood. And I'm referring, of course, to the Scientific American. Mr. Gerard Peel, who is our speaker tonight, is the president and the publisher of that very excellent publication. Now, the layman is not necessarily a non-scientist. An archaeologist is a layman when it comes to number theory, and vice versa. Now, Mr. Peel uh, has a good many honorary degrees, good many things I could say about him, and he urged me not to do so. If any of you are interested, you can look it all up in who's who. But he did permit me to say that he's a trustee of Radcliffe College. Mr. Peel's topic is actually the topic of the entire series, Science in the Modern World. He is well known for a book that he had written on the subject of science and the cause of man. It is my great pleasure to present to you Mr. Peel. I must say that in the Teresa Kaufman concert hall, I feel a great deal more at home in the second row of the balcony uh, with the Budapest string quartet down here. And uh, if only we could have arranged things that way for this evening, uh, uh, I think we'd all have a I think I've got it. <clears throat> We'd all have uh, a more ennobling time, I think. <clears throat> I undertake my uh, responsibility here in the launching of the Jacob Wolf Lecture Series uh, 
with a heavy sense of that responsibility because uh, this wonderful hall is the scene of some of the most um, elevating and lovely events that go on in the cultural life of our city, and it isn't often given over to science. And the question that uh, is put here is whether a lecture series devoted to the sciences and to the relation of science to the life of modern man uh, has a place here. It's got to be awfully good to uh, meet the competition, and uh, so I have a very specially heavy responsibility in of uh, giving the first lecture. The subject of science is a subject that engrosses uh, all uh, concerned citizens in our day. It is uh, an enterprise that now takes up a very substantial percentage of our gross national product, if we'll count uh, especially the D in the R and D, uh, that R and D vul vulgarism stands for research and development, and the numbers get very big when you uh, count the development side. And the development enterprise, of course, is concerned basically with the application of uh, scientific knowledge. Now, whatever other impression may be given by the enormous attention and in the press and uh, uh, the devotion of our national treasure and the talent of our brave young men, for example, in the space enterprise, uh, the fact of the matter is that the truth-seeking and the tool-making enterprise of science by no means encompasses all of the concerns of man. Remote recesses of the interior experience of life and distant reaches of the exterior universe will always remain to lure and to defy the inquirer. But the fact also remains that today there are few realms of human concern that have not been invaded by the method of rational inquiry, which is science. Few realms of human concern to which knowledge gained there and the methods of attack on problems there are not relevant to the life of man. An understanding of science then is essential to each man's orientation in the world as, as it is known to the culture of the 20th century. And so to experience life as a contemporary of our day is to experience uh, the work of science and to share in its yield. Both as knowledge and as process, science responds to deeply troubling questions and to ancient questions. Who are we? Whence have we come? Whither do we go? Moreover, science shows us how to ask questions like this in progressive and productive ways that lead on to more significant and useful and resultful questions, questions that enlarge the meaning of those original primitive questions. Beneath the surfaces of things that are accessible to our unaided senses and to our first inquiry, science discloses forces and dynamics, transformations, symmetries and diversities, order, precision, and grandeur that have been unknown to previous generations. So these are without doubt some of the considerations, philosophical, moral, and aesthetic that motivate the present rising public interest in the work of science. These questions and these interests are as natural to a liberal outlook and an informed outlook on the modern world as 
uh, sophistication in the humanities. But now something else must be added to the subject of science as a realm of human understanding and inquiry. And that is that it leads to control of nature. It <clears throat> leads to increase in the power <clears throat> in the hands of man. In our utilitarian society, in fact, this is the aspect of science that most challenges public interest and public investment. And in our utilitarian so uh, society, we tend to think of science as concerned with the means, with the tools of human existence and reserved to the humanist, to the uh, uh, by all means, however else he's described, the non-scientist, uh, the concern uh, with questions of value, questions of ethics, questions of human purpose and choice. So it is, in the words, for example, of uh, our country's foremost practicing moral philosopher, the President of the United States, L Lyndon B. Johnson, <coughs> uh, in celebrating the passage by Congress of the legislation that established the National Foundation for the Humanities, Mr. Johnson uh, voiced the celebratory feeling, uh, voicing the celebratory feeling of the occasion said, of course, we need science to give us our tools, but we need the humanities to give us our values. Now, coming from that source, it may sound ill-informed, but let me remind you that the faculties of our universities are universally organized into faculties of arts and sciences. And there is almost no communication uh, across the broad gulf that is implied by those two divisions of learning. In other words, the pre president was expressing the prevailing view uh, with respect to the role of science in the modern world. And I take it, therefore, as my duty tonight, because I believe that that view is probably widely shared in this audience, to undertake a strong proposition. It is to argue that science has as much to do with the ends and purposes and choices of human existence as it has to do with the means by which men arrive at and seek those ends and purposes. And here I talk not, o not alone about the role of science in enlarging and informing our sense of identity, our sense of self-recognition, uh, establishing a rational picture of our place in the world. I'm talking also about the tools. I'm talking about science as technology. And I reject uh, that sub-dichotomy of this big dichotomy that separate science from technology, as well as science and technology from the humanities. Because I believe that uh, altogether we are concerned with a continuum of human activity, expression of human capacity and energy, and uh, I argue that uh, ends are inextricable from means uh, in every human enterprise, in every human activity and that the great tool-making enterprise of science, because in the end it is a tool-making enterprise, because knowledge brings with it inevitably control and power, has played a central role in the opening up and in the forming and shaping of human choice and decision. And so in undertaking to talk to you about science in the modern world, and its relation to human value and human ends, human goal choosing, goal framing, uh, I'm going to undertake a historical review in order to put our present in a useful perspective. And to lead us on uh, into our subject, I'm going to invoke the works of a great American historian, Henry Adams. Henry Adams, in a typically American fashion, recognized 
the profound relationship between the scientific and technological enterprise and uh, the, his the historical experience of man. He created a great many tables of statistics in which from one table to the next he plotted the rising curves of the production of coal, the rising curves of the production of iron, the increasing number of uh, miles of highways and of railroads <coughs> through the 18th and 19th, through the 18th and 19th centuries. Of course, there weren't railroads in the 18th. Uh, and as he plotted these curves, he noted, and I, I quote him, he said, any schoolboy could plot such curves and see that arithmetical ratios were useless. The curves followed the old familiar law of the square. That is, they rose more steeply as they ascended from the time baseline. And he plotted them on a logarithmic baseline uh, on which the... Uh, oh, now, I need, here I need Professor Shedlovsky to, to uh, tidy up my language. But uh, uh, you will observe that here we go back a thousand years. The units uh, are a century from point to point. And when we go, get into the next uh, section of our table, the units become thousand years. We go up as, as, the, by the, as, the, as the, the square from uh, each one section to the next. And the uh, proportions of the, of the baseline describe not only this logarithmic convenience which, which expands the recent present and hence makes it possible for you to, to see a curve like this, which if it were plotted on an arithmetic baseline with regular units here, would come along hunting the baseline and make a right angle turn. Uh, it also represents a good psychological model of human memory, because our memory of the most recent century occupies a great deal more space in our mind than that of the preceding, and so on back with the Centuries occupy shorter and shorter intervals of time, and so the past millennium, which is plotted here in this first section of the chart, occupies just as much time as the preceding 9,000 years that make up the 10 millennia um, of time that are suggested on this baseline. Now, uh, he plots his curves on this kind of chart in order to see this curve. <coughs> He says, and in order to discover the point at which uh, this acceleration of human activity uh, through science and technology came into play. And he observed that the acceleration of the 17th century was, uh, as he said, was rapid, and that of the 18th century was startling. <clears throat> the acceleration even became measurable, he says, for it took the form of utilizing heat as force through the steam engine. And this addition of power was measurable in the coal output. And so, Adams said, acceleration was the law of human history. <clears throat> now, one of Adams' great American contemporaries was Josiah Willard Gibbs, who was res responsible for uh, the fundamental mathematical theory of thermodynamics and uh, of, of uh, uh, phase systems in chemical reactions. Uh, Adams, as a knowledgeable contemporary, was familiar with this work. He was familiar with the work that was going on in the laboratories at the Case Institute of Technology where Michelson and Morley were measuring the speed of light, and he recognized the strain this put on the classical hypothesis of the ether. And uh, uh, he was a a layman, as Professor Shedlovsky defined a layman, uh, a scholar of history who is a layman in the sciences and a knowledgeable and well-informed layman. And from his acquaintance with Gibbs's historic work, Adams produced uh, a very interesting metaphor. He spoke of the phases of history. He recognized the changes in quantity uh, in chemical reactions, for example, uh, 
make for changes in quality, which you express as changes in phase. And so he proposed that history had proceeded in three major phases. And he, he spoke of a mechanical phase, an electrical phase, and what he called an ethereal phase, uh, the ethereal phase uh, representing the phase of history that was to follow the historic discoveries in physics uh, that physics was then verging upon as a result of the overthrow of some of the basic postulates of classical mechanics in uh, the experiment of Michelson and Morley and other contemporary work. Uh, Adam says, supposing the mechanical phase of history, the classical Newtonian phase, so to speak, could have, should have lasted 300 years. From 1600 to 1900, the next, or the electrical phase, and that's that yellow bar, would last only the square root of 300 years, uh, or about 17 years and a half. When, he says, that is in 1917, and he's writing in 1905, it would pass into another and ethereal phase, which for half a century, he says, science has been promising and which would last only the square root of 17 and a half years, or about four years, and then may bring thought to the limit of its possibilities about the year 1921. <clears throat> says Adams, it may well be Nothing whatever is beyond the range of possibility. And even if the life of the preceding phase of si from 1600 to 1900 is stretched another hundred years, the difference to the last term of the equation would be negligible. In that case, the ethereal phase might, he said, last to the year 2025. And so it would appear that by Henry Adams' calculations, our lives uh, are cast in that probationary period between 1921 and 2025. We're living on probation. Adams, for his part, despaired of our capacity to withstand the overriding forces of change that had been set in motion by science and technology. He said it is quite sure, according to my score of ratios and curves, that at the accelerated rate of progression since 1600, it will not need another century and a half to turn thought upside down. Law, he said, in that case would disappear and give place to force. Morality would become police. Explosives would reach cosmic violence. In fact, <clears throat> Adams went so far as to liken this curve to the path of a comet. And you know a comet comes roaring in out of distant space, makes its sharp turn around its perihelion nearest to the sun, and then disappears and flies off again into space. Adams said, if the calculated curve of the deflection of thought from 1600 to 1900 were put on that of the comet, it would show that man's evolution had passed perihelion and that his movement was already retrograde. And so, one distinguished American historian, out of his first consideration of the relation of science to the modern world, came to rather despairing conclusion. Uh, Adams, as I think you know, chose the virgin over the dynamo and uh, regarded science as a primary threat to the values that he cherished. Now, needless to say, I hold another view. And taking Adam's <clears throat> symbol of the exponential curve, uh, let's look at the history of science and its relationship to the human experience and spread out uh, this pattern of events and see what sense it makes for life in our time. In the first place, <clears throat> we'll extend Adam's curve time baseline backward now from uh, the past millennium to 10,000 years ago to 100,000 years ago and in a, in a quite symbolic way I've here plotted uh, that exponential curve 
and extended it in both directions. Uh, I take liberty with the whole science of statistics here to take changes in quality in human thought and experience and count them as quantitative event, as events quantitatively, and they lie uh, rather reasonably well along the slope of that curve. We look here at the progression in the discovery of the natural forces. And we begin, begin in the first place with the concept of a natural force. That had, to, that had to come in human life, for in the innocent days of, of uh, the beginnings of agricultural civilization and in, among primitive men, it is thought that every event in nature is vested and moved by its own uh, uh, indwelling spirit, the animus, the genius of the place. And so the concept of an in inanimate, uh, in independent natural force came first 2,000 years ago in the porches of Athens. We come forward then quite a long time to the uh, 14th and 15th century and the force of gravitation is recognized, the universal force of inertia in the two world systems of Galileo uh, uh, developed by his successors into the great plan of uh, Newtonian classical physics. <clears throat> it's then uh, <clears throat> two or three hundred more years, two hundred more years before uh, the ideas, basic ideas of electromagnetism are laid down, and that's only a hundred years ago. Uh, the work of Clark Maxwell, Faraday, and uh, the crowning triumphs of mid-19th century physics. Then only 50 years ago, in our own time, the recognition of the nuclear force, and now physicists are conjuring with the discovery of a fourth universal force in nature, uh, if we may now even speak of forces, and carry this animistic notion uh, forward in the analysis of the world, the weak force, which provides it the disintegration of the elementary particles. And see how uh, <clears throat> these primary discoveries occur with increasing frequency into our own very day. Here I've plotted the isolation of the elements. Available to primitive man were perhaps six elements, uh, some of them occurring naturally and pure in nature, like the noble metal gold. Others isolated with his primitive technology, uh, iron and, uh, and uh, uh, perhaps by accident, carbon and so on. Uh, come <clears throat> forward to 200 years ago and uh, the founding of modern chemistry by Lavoisier and his contemporaries, and perhaps 20 elements have been uh, isolated by the work of the alchemists and uh, and by the first efforts of modern experimental chemistry. And with the blossoming of these ideas, the uh, science moves forward swiftly in the next uh, century. And by the mid-19th century, Mendeleev has plotted out the periodic table of the elements, at which time the number of elements exceeds 60 that are known in the sciences. And then in a very few years, the table is filled out and today, the curve can be plotted beyond to represent the increasing multiplicity of fundamental particles. Here, we plot the baseline of the, 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 the uh, curve reaches further backward in time to, to 40 or 50,000 years ago when primitive man first begins to use fire as a major technological instrument for clearing the forest lands, extending the grasslands over which he hunted the ungulates that provided uh, his primary food as a, as a land-dwelling uh, continental animal. Uh, <clears throat> this, at this time, the hand of man would be visible for the first time from uh, the face of the moon. Then, in the Bronze Age, four or five thousand years ago, comes with the wheel, the harnessing of the power of falling water. Wind becomes a major tool in uh, Renaissance technology uh, with the invention of the windmill, uh, medieval technology, with the invention of the windmill on the coast of Normandy, a little industrial revolution all of its own that spread in 100 years to the shores of the Black Sea. 200 years ago, uh, the, the steam engine. Only 100 years ago, the internal combustion engine. 
you could plot others, I suppose, between there and, and the present and the, the nuclear uh, engines, the nuclear power plants that are now pumping electrical power. And so we see plotted here on a single chart uh, the record of accumulated, accumulated human experience. And this is the essence of what uh, the technological and scientific enterprise is, that it is accumulative, uh, that each generation builds on the results and, and yield of the last generation's effort. It's quite, a, quite clear from the chart that the major developments in, in uh, accumulated human experience have occurred within the most recent times. And they occur at shorter and shorter time intervals into the very present. Now, of course, this chart does not begin to tell the entire story of history. It plots only the accumulative elements of human experience, and it excludes the rest. That is, it excludes the glory and the tragedy and the shame and the honor and the bestial and the humane. And so by some people's lights, it excludes all that gives meaning to history. Yet the exponential curve that's plotted here, I believe, plots the mainstream of history, insofar as history has not merely repeated itself. This assertion is confirmed when we place the brief period of recorded time which really occupies no more than the last 10,000 years in the perspective of man's much longer past. At the giddy vantage point on the vertical coordinate of this curve, of, of this chart, to which we have now proceeded, we are as far from the 19th century as primitive man was uh, a full 10,000 and even 50 and 100,000 years ago. So to get the story in perspective, we really ought to go back to the beginning of this experience. And to go back to the beginning today, it's quite clear, we have to go back not 10,000, not 100,000, but even more than a million years to an upland valley in, in Africa where, as many of you know, in the last few years, one spectacular discovery after another has been made about the early origins of the human species. And at least a million seven hundred thousand years ago, and perhaps two and a half million years ago, there are found in uh, well-established sites the bones of a primitive human being and the tools that the hands of that human being made. Now, the human being we're talking about here uh, gets qualified as a human being only in the sort of classical nomenclature of physical anthropology because he turns out to be a tool maker. You see, tool making is the status symbol of membership in the human species. Uh, and so uh, that title is accorded to this creature. But he doesn't look at all human. Didn't weigh more than about 75 or 80 pounds, stood about so high, still used his hands for walking. Uh, but here at the very beginning was the first primary invention of all, the invention of the tool. The invention of the tool was made by what we would all have to agree is a pre-human animal. And it becomes clear then uh, in the record of what I call here the biological phase of human history that tool making plays a central role in the very biological evolution of man in the shaping of uh, his hands and of the brain that manages those hands, uh, the two being integrally part of the same uh, remarkable evolving organism. And so one could turn the uh, old status symbol around and say that tools made men, not that men made tools. Uh, but either way is putting the issue much too simply. What, what is important to say is that tool making as an adaptive capacity played a primary role in the evolution of the human species. And it's quite clear uh, in the stone tools, which are the most numerous fossil of the Pleistocene period of the last million years, the most numerous fossil of human experience, these fossils of behavior show us that before men were human in 
in the sense that we would recognize human beings and even setting aside the monstrous preju prejudices that separate living uh, homo sapiens uh, into races and so on, uh, that in the subhuman phase of his evolution, learning, education, love, uh, family, uh, uh, all played a part in the evolving organism. And above all, it becomes clear that somewhere here in this dark past came the first formation of purpose of action. And with that, the, the, for, the forming of goals, and here we must say the invention of value, is perhaps a pre-human event in the history of life. Now, at the end of this period, 100,000 years ago, we have a remarkably well-equipped uh, primitive uh, human being with a primitive culture, which certainly within the first, the earliest 50,000 year period of that 100,000 years, <clears throat> succeeded in establishing itself in every single physical environment on Earth. Uh, those primitive cultures that anthropologists have studied, and you're going to be hearing from Harry Shapiro about his work in this field, have taught us to use the word primitive with high respect. In the first place, there's no such thing as a primitive language. Every language has its syntax, has its logic, uh, has its, its, its grammar, and has its capacity to express uh, poetry. Uh, the <clears throat> Aesthetic experience grows along with the technological experience. Uh, the culture of these peoples uh, are powerful systems that uh, bind the individual to service of the survival of his family, his extended kinship family, which is essentially uh, the society that he knows. And, uh, it, they, these must be regarded as enormously successful societies, for some of them have persisted for tens of thousands of years, have lasted and succeeded much longer than our own quite tentative experiment with the high technology in our time. <clears throat> at the end of this 10,000 year period, as Roger Revelle said the other evening at the American Museum of Natural History, it was probably some clever woman who invented agriculture. <clears throat> but. The, the record shows that it was something like that, that the beginning of settled human habitation uh, here at the Neolithic turning point in human experience uh, brought the invention of uh, agriculture. It wasn't a single invention. It was an evolving discovery and process uh, coming out of food gathering and collecting uh, and the uh, domestication of the first domestic animals that brought on uh, the agricultural revolution. And with the agricultural revolution, we see an entirely new uh, human order and human society come into being, especially in uh, the East, where agriculture depended upon major engineering works, cooperative enterprises in, in uh, soil conservation, in water conservation, and water management, irrigation, and so on. Uh, enterprises that required essentially highly dictatorial societies. And so we see human life and human relationships take still another form. Now uh, <clears throat> we see emerge in the world uh, th the ideas of the caste system uh, that separate society into the 80% or so who live to serve uh, and sustain the well-being of the very few percent who ride at the very top. History, uh, as it is recorded over this period, is essentially the experience of the 10 or 12 percent at the very top of society who participated and experienced uh, history and were the beneficiaries of the social order that bound all other men to uh, sustain uh, their great adventures. And history is the story of their exploitation of their fellow men and their exploitation of the fabulous opportunities opened up to them to begin to carry on the enterprises of high civilization and to build empires in great cities 
and uh, sponsor works of art and so forth and so on. Uh, over these millennia, uh, progress in technology is substantial. In fact, um, the ducks of Calcutta today are worked by machinery that is to be seen uh, in the friezes of Egyptian temples. Uh, but in the lifetime of a man, as you can see, the slope of this curve is imperceptible. And furthermore, the intervals of, uh, on the baseline of the chart here are thousands of years. So the lifetime of a man uh, is, is smaller than the width of this spot of light I'm putting on the screen. So that technological change uh, must have been imperceptible to the lives of individuals uh, living throughout this period. As Bertrand de Juvenal uh, has described the situation, he said, as long as there is a fairly constant limit to production per capita with a constant technology, one man can gain wealth only by making use of another man's labor. So only a few members of society can gain wealth and that at the expense of the rest. All ancient civilizations rested upon the inexplicit premise that the productivity of labor is constant. And that fundamentally is the story of history uh, through uh, the agricultural period. The inexplicit premise of scarcity is sta stated plainly enough in the plans of the ancient cities as they have been unearthed by archaeologists. Invariably, they show the palace, the temple, and the garrison within the ruin of the walls, and outside the traces in the soil of the hovels of the slaves. And thus it was that four-fifths of the population was made to render up the surplus necessary to sustain one-fifth in the new enterprises of high civilization. Now, something like uh, sometime in the last millennium, another big change begins to com come over human existence with the accelerating curve of, of technological change. And in this phase, the industrial phase of, of human history, the surplus that, that is gathered in by the institutions of scarcity invented under agricultural civilization <clears throat> find a new historic function. That surplus becomes what Adam Smith called the wealth of the nations, to be invested in the increase in capacity to produce wealth. Though hindsight encourages us to place emphasis on the acceleration of the rate of discovery and invention in this period, and surely it did come as is well plotted not only by Henry Adams by, but by others, we must not fail to credit the role of the institutions of political economy. In 1802, looking with satisfaction on the ascendance of Britain, which was then in the vanguard of the Industrial Revolution, Sir Humphrey Davy, a, one of the members of the royal of the early members of the Royal Society of London, uh, astutely observed the unequal division of property and of labor, the difference of rank and condition amongst mankind, are the sources of power in civilized life, its moving causes, and its very soul. For it was the persisting institutions set up in the long millennia of scarcity that made it possible to build and, and, and assemble the enormous uh, uh, capital accumulations that launched the industrial system in Europe and in America. Uh, a great deal of credit is given to the role of savings in classical economy, but the historical record plainly shows that most of that saving was involuntary and the interest on the savings was paid to the wrong people. <clears throat> now today, after two centuries of industrial revolution, we have come to speak of two kinds of nations, developed and underdeveloped, or in plainer language, rich and poor. Some 20 odd nations have entered the industrial phase of human history. They em embrace about one third of the world's population. To one degree or another, the entire populations of these countries are entrained in the heady experience 
of rising individual well-being. <clears throat> it's no accident that the nations which set out first on this course and have come farthest have also given the world the most favorable demonstration of the possibility of self-government by free citizens who count no second-class citizens among their numbers. The poor nations in the world, on the other hand, comprise a whole two-thirds of mankind still immured in the economic and technological and social mire of agricultural civilization and include tens of millions of people in Africa and Southeast Asia that are caught at this turn in history in transition from the primitive to the agricultural phase of history. But by all the quantitative indexes that measure the contrast between the rich nations, the rich industrial nations, and the poor, history has entered on still another phase. And the arrival of that phase in human experience is nowhere so, de so well demonstrated as in the experience of our own country. And I present here a few more numbers plotted on the same extraordinary kinds of curves that show here the consumption of electrical energy per capita in the United States. Our curve goes back here to the turn of the century when uh, the curve starts at about 150 kilowatt hours per capita. Now it's an interesting coincidence that 150 kilowatt hours is the equivalent of a man year of work. So there was available here the electrical equivalent of a human slave for each and every man, woman, and child in America. Of course, we'd abolished slavery 30 or 40 years earlier uh, since, uh, at this point, mechanical energy had obsoleted the biological en energy generated by uh, the muscles of men and beasts. From 1955 to 1965, that number doubled again. And here, at 6,000 kilowatt hours uh, per capita in America, we have the equivalent of 40 human slaves for each man, woman, and child. Now, if that had been the doubling of actual human slaves, the event would have attracted considerably more notice. But the fact that, our, that, the, that the energy available in our abundant economy has doubled in this past decade has passed without notice. The difference between our consumption of energy back in 1955 and in 1965 is that gain by itself is greater than the highest consumption of electrical energy per capita in any other country in the world. We look at the arrival of a new primary material, a new metal in our technology. It's a precious metal displayed at the uh, various world's fairs at the turn of the century. Uh, in 1938 or 9, on the verge of the outbreak of the Second World War, uh, we've come up to 500,000 uh, tons uh, of the metal in production. The number has soared since then to uh, 3,000, uh, to 3,000,000, 3, that is, 3 million tons uh, of the metal. And uh, if a proper multiple is added here to, uh, 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 can, to take account of the volumetric enclosure of this metal, so you can compare it with steel in terms of its use in technology, uh, it is now a metal that is competing with steel uh, across the boards in, in every use. Uh, synthetic materials, these high polymers, which have as their principal virtue uh, the plastics, that they imitate the qualities of organic materials, that is, materials made by living things, uh, come soaring here. And here, instead of having a number exp expressed in pounds, uh, we've got an index number, and the best one can get for this rapidly moving curve is that um, somewhere in the late, uh, in the early, well, say at the end of the war, uh, it starts somewhere below 50 and soars to above to nearly 250 on the, on the index number, index base, uh, by 1965. Here is uh, perhaps the most interesting figure of all. Uh, this is electronic circuits packed per cubic foot. Now, the kind of circuit we're talking about here is the circuit 
required, the circuitry required to store a single number, that is one or zero in the binary arithmetic of the computer. Uh, <clears throat> that minimal circuit uh, involves, uh, let's say, in uh, the 1930s, a vacuum tube could be packed uh, with uh, the use of all of the artifices of uh, uh, electronic technology at that time to about, well, at most, 100 circuits per cubic foot. Uh, in 1955, at the end of the war, or see, miniaturization of the vacuum tube raises this number considerably. It goes up to a couple of hundred circuits per cubic foot here. And here we have a, a logarithmic scale on our, on our vertical scale. We get to 1955 and the transistor comes in. And uh, we now have solid state electronics to work with. And the number of circuits jumps quickly to 1,000 and past 1,000, now past uh, 10,000. In, in current computer practice, uh, and this is a conservative curve, it is at, uh, at the rate of 100,000 circuits per cubic foot with highly miniaturized circuits that now uh, occupy hundreds and even thousands of them occupy a single tiny wafer of solid state material. And quite plainly, this technology is headed on toward a million circuits per cubic foot. Now, the significance of this is not uh, some Olympic competition uh, toward seeing, seeing who can pack the most just for that purpose. The capacity of a computer is essentially dependent upon the speed with which an electrical signal travels through the circuitry of a, of a, of a computer. And the shorter that, that travel time is, in other words, the shorter the distance traveled by the, the, uh, the, the signal through the circuit, the more information, the more computations the computer can handle. And so this has a, a primary function in the development of the supercomputers that are coming into use in technology and in public affairs and play, are playing such a primary and central role now in the, the entire design of, uh, of uh, not only technological apparatus, but uh, the social apparatus of our society. <clears throat> now, developments of this kind <clears throat> quite plainly have had a profound impact on the way men live in, in American society. To remind you of these changes, let's go back for a moment to the year 1900, when we see that 73% of the American labor force is engaged in the production of goods. Half of the labor force here at the 50% line, are engaged in work by the sweat of their brow. They are farmers and they are farmhands and unskilled laborers. These are the men who did turned in an honest day's work. <clears throat> Here, uh, a much smaller element in the productive workforce are the operatives of industry, the machine tenders. And above them, a smaller number, the skilled workers of, of industry. And over here, was this curious new element in the social order and the economic order, the providers of services, now so numerous as a group that they show up as a significant statistical group and can be counted. They represent 27% of the labor force. Sales and services, clerical people, managerial people, and this curious new class uh, that now emerges as a statistical unit, professional people. <clears throat> Here, 60 years later, the situation has begun to reverse. And less than half of the labor force, only 47% of the labor force, today is engaged in producing goods. Farmers and farmhands and unskilled laborers are getting to be as scarce as Indians. The operatives, who are the most numerous workers in the productive workforce, the machine tenders, Still, these are the people who are still employed in industry, operating machines that are not yet under fully automatic control. And then come the skilled workers. Over here, the providers of services now in the majority, with the fastest growing group, the professional group, uh, among whom must be counted as a significantly rising number, the scientific and technical people of our society. <clears throat> in, 1950, uh, we had about 12 and a half million, 12 million eight 
blue-collar workers in our manufacturing industry. Ten years later, we had 12,500,000. Today, uh, another six years later, with the short-term effects of the lamentable entanglements of American foreign policy, that number is maybe up back to 12,800,000. <clears throat> Essentially, we have a constant blue-collar factory workforce. Yet in the period from 1950 to 1960, the output of the American manufacturing system went up by nearly 50% with a constant factory workforce. Now, how could that be? It's perfectly clear that this output with the constant man hours, and you see how this man hour curve tends to hunt the fluctuations of foreign policy much more now than the uh, business cycle, that uh, the curve of productivity here, the blue curve, tends to run ahead of output. And it is increasing productivity per worker that accounts for uh, this rise in output. And in fact, a study made by a distinguished commission of economists and businessmen uh, at the direction of President Johnson <clears throat> looks at this entire period and finds that if we start in 1947 with a gross national product of a... Of, of, roughly $300 billion, plotting it in constant dollars, we see in 1965 a gross national product exceeding $600 billion. And they calculated that of that $300 billion increase, that the gain in, in gross national product from increase in man hours was only about $30 billion worth, and $270 billion worth had come from technological change. And it is developments of that kind, then, that underlie this transformation of our society from one that employs uh, a major portion of its workforce in the production of goods to one that employs a declining minority of its workers in the production of goods. In fact, if, the, if, if we were to plot here the workforce engaged in producing 80% of the output, it would be less than 25%. Of our, work, of our total workforce. Um, as it stands, uh, we can still show something like 46% engaged in produ producing goods. But look, it was in this period from 47 to 65, in the most recent period, that we went through this social revolution and uh, crossed this, this line where we can expect to see on a permanent basis, no matter how large and fast our gross national product rises, a declining number of people engaged in the productive functions, uh, classically defined. Because over here, of course, the professionals are the main producers of the system because it is their input of technology and of new, no, new knowledge, new force, new command of nature that accounts for uh, the swiftly rising output. And so we have a society which, has, which shows this curious composition between 1900 and 1960, with this declining minority of producers of goods and this rising number of people engaged in providing services. There's still another interesting change that has come in the American system under the impact of uh, science and technology, and this is where uh, we look at, po at political and social consequences uh, more than the economic. We look here at the occupational status of the adult population, that is, everyone above the age of 18 in 1900. We see that something like 40% were not employed. These were those who were still in school, uh, housewives at home, and uh, men who, who had retired. We had 57% uh, or so of the, of the workforce of the adult population employed in jobs in the private sector, with only 3% of the adult population or about 5% uh, of, the, of the workforce employed in public jobs, in the public sector. And so our country at this time approximated its, its romantic model of itself as a people engaged in the pursuit of happiness, that is, uh, their own welfare or the welfare of their employer, uh, pr primarily engaged in pursuing private ends and purposes. <clears throat> Here, uh, 60 years later, we see uh, the same 40% outside the labor force, but now there are a lot of young men outside the labor force uh, whose educations are prolonged. There are a lot of men, elder men outside the labor force who have retired and 
something like 30 or 40 percent of our labor force over here is now made up of women. And uh, in, in, in the labor force, and employed in the public sector is a full third of our labor force. Uh, in other words, uh, we look at the breakdown between the private sector and the public sector, and we see as, that as compared to 1900, 30%, uh, a rapidly growing percentage of uh, the entire American population is engaged in activities that are motivated by the public interest. They're either employed directly on the public sector payrolls or they're employed in the private sector on jobs that are created by dollars spent by the public sector over in the private sector to procure the services of, of engineering firms, for example, uh, in the building of highways. It also unhappily represents the 10% of our workforce that is engaged in the military enterprise. If we didn't have that 10% engaged in the military enterprise, there'd be a whole 10% of our workforce available to accomplish other neglected public ends and purposes in uh, the American system. And this is how the, the, the society has responded to the enormous impact of uh, technological change uh, the, 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 the simple-minded notion that it would create unemployment is, <clears throat> is uh, offset by the uh, discovery uh, that enormous public purposes are now open to achievement and, and uh, new kinds of goal-seeking are now open to our society. <clears throat> uh, if we're not using this enormous capacity uh, to uh, accomplish the neglected public purposes uh, of which each of us could make uh, our own list of priorities, <clears throat> it's quite plain that the constraints are not in our physical capacity to do the job. Uh, we are passing into a new period of history when the concern of men is no longer with the old problem of getting on, uh, but rather with the task of enriching and in and it now becomes possible to enrich and increase the possibility of human life for every, every member of society. The <clears throat> old regime of scarcity that we have carried over from the past is clearly at an end. And the time has come to, increase, to repeal that iron law of, that Bertrand de, de Juvenel talked of that says that one man's well-being can be increased only at the expense of his brothers. And so <clears throat> it now becomes possible uh, through the uh, tools that science and technology have placed in our hands to create the kind of society that uh, uh, men have dreamed of uh, from earliest times. Uh, we, we must learn to frame new values and new institutions to respond to uh, uh, this new dispensation of abundance. Uh, the dispensation that says that the well-being of each man increases with the well-being of all men. And so uh, it is now possible for men to begin to move into an, a new period of history, uh, which we can call the humane phase of history, uh, with the power to make a human existence possible for every member of human society. And it is in this fashion, uh, challenging our institutions that we carry over from the past, that uh, man's understanding and his rise, increasing control of nature opens up new goals and new possibilities to human life and so, uh, so challenges us in our time and surely before the end of this century to, to create entirely new uh, goals and new institutions for achieving those goals that now open up to, to human existence. And not least among these is the overcoming of poverty in the underdeveloped countries of the world, uh, which is clearly central to the, uh, uh, to the resolution of the uh, remaining conflicts of uh, the national state. Uh, with this uh, demonstration, I hope I've suggested to you the 
central relationship between the scientific enterprise and uh, the goal-shaping and purpose-forming uh, activity of man. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org. Thank <laughs> you.